Hello and welcome to Inside Sports. I'm your host, Todd Blackstock. We have a fun show for you today. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch sports columnist, Benjamin Hockman, will join us in studio to discuss some exciting sports stories occurring in the STL. We will visit the 2020 Missouri Valley Conference Men's Basketball Tournament, we all know as Arch Madness. Inside Sports reporter Melanie Steen has a story about how video games can become a career. And Angela Sharp checks in from the Battle Dome, home of our XFL football team, the Battle Hawks. So we have this and much more coming up next on Inside Sports. And welcome to the show. It's such an exciting time to be in St. Louis. Over at the Enterprise Center, we have several NCAA basketball events going on with Arch Madness and the first two rounds of the Big Dance. The St. Louis Blues are working hard on their quest to defend the Stanley Cup. While the MLS soccer stadium is moving forward on Market Street, the Battle Hawks are breathing new life in the downtown, and of course, the St. Louis Cardinals opening day is upon us. Well, this year, the Redbirds open the season on the road versus Cincinnati, then Milwaukee, and the unofficial spring holiday each year we know as opening day in the STL will be Thursday, April 2nd at 3 p.m. versus the American League Baltimore Orioles. It seems strange to be opening against the, the American League team, but there's a great history here. The Baltimore Orioles were once the St. Louis Browns for over 50 years, beginning in 1902 and relocating following the 1953 season. Bill DeWitt Sr. was the owner of the Browns from 1948 to 1950 until he sold the team to Bill Veck. A lot of history here, except the Orioles don't recognize the Browns. Here's Browns fan club president, Ed Wheatley. Bill Veck, because he's pulling stunts like Eddie Goodell, stunts like grandstand manager, and things of that nature, he's forced to sell. And the Browns then go to Baltimore. So the Browns go to Baltimore, and the Baltimore Orioles, their fans, their, I mean, their ownership groups wants absolutely nothing to do with the history of the Browns. Well, they, they took the, the uh, position in 1954. The Browns died and were buried in St. Louis. They did not come east. In 1901, as I spoke earlier, the American League was formed. There was a team in the American League, the original eight, Baltimore Orioles. But Ben Johnson moved that team in 1904 to New York to become what is the Yankees. So then Baltimore backfilled it with one of the greatest minor league uh, franchises in all baseball history, and they choose to recognize that minor league franchise as their heritage, not the Browns. And part of it was, too, the tainted uh, shenanigans of, of Bill Veck had put a bad taste on, you know, these guys are coming, coming east. <laughs> we'll stick with the uh, franchise of the minors. Well, to pay homage to the city's former American League team, the Cardinals have a statue of the greatest Browns player ever, George Sisler, outside of Bush Stadium. Well, the XFL has taken St. Louis by storm, and STL TV's Angela Sharp is down at the freshly coined Battle Dome at America Center. Well, hey there, Todd. We are here on the field for the Battle Hawks home opener. The pep rally was crazy. People are really excited to have football back in St. Louis. I'm excited too, but I also need to congratulate you on your 20th anniversary of Inside Sports. What is that, the first show to win an Emmy for STL TV. So congratulations for your 20th year and check this out. It is moments before the doors open here at the St. Louis Battle Hawks. People are lined up outside and ready to come in. And when they come in, they're going to get this awesome rally towel. That's right. Football is back in St. Louis. We are so excited for the St. Louis Battle Hawks. Uh, you guys, I think we might have found the youngest Battle Hawks fan. Is that right? Caca. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first of all, Jace, by the way, is adorable. Thank you. Um, but why did you guys bring out your six-week-old baby to the home opener of the Battle Hawks? Because it matters. We're raising him to be able to function in public. And, I mean, he was ready to go. He was ready to go. He was ready to go. What are you guys, are you, what are you guys most excited about, about having football back in St. Louis? 
Uh, just great having football in St. Louis. When we moved here, the Rams left the very next year after we moved, so we didn't get to experience that up here. So we're just glad to actually have football back, and now we got said the youngest fan here. trying to get through the anthem got to the end and this place erupted st louis was missing football and they're excited to have it back here you can hear them these fans are allowed it's a fun time to be a st louis sports fan we're gonna have to go find a spot to go watch this game Thanks, Angela. I love the scene during the Battle Hawks game. And joining us now to further discuss the XFL, along with some trending local stories, is Benjamin Hockman from the St. Louis Post Dispatch. Ben, thanks for joining us. Caw -caw! <laughs> the Battle Hawks, <laughs> I tell you what, I'm coming down, I don't know what to think. I, they, there's going to be a big crowd. I'm walking up, I start tearing up. Really? It reminded me of like when the Rams games were there, you see the MAC was packed. You know, the park and all the tailgates were around there. It just wasn't quite as spread out, but the density was there. What are your thoughts on the Battle Hawks so far? We don't know where this is going. Is it a fad? Is it a phase? Is it formidable? We'll have to see, but right now it's, it's pretty fun. It's pretty fun. I mean, think about some of the talent. I mean, starting at quarterback, Jordan Taumel, or I think that's how you say yeah, it. It's yeah. kind of a typo. You know, it's kind of a hard one to say. Sure. But he's been on some uh, NFL rosters. He's doing very well. Everybody is chanting MVP. <laughs> Kristen Michael, I played with the Seahawks. I picked him up one time on a bye week. Yeah. You know, they've got some pretty good talent. I think, uh, you know, Jonathan Hayes has assembled quite a team. And I think what's fun about it is, and what kind of puts it in perspective, is the fact that we don't necessarily even know how to pronounce all the players' names. <laughs> it, the idea of the that we're still learning the league, we'll st we're still learning the personnel, but we love St. Louis, and we love that these people want to be in St. Louis with professional football. You know, inside the dome, filling up the lower bowl, it got pretty loud in there. It got very loud, and I'm up in the press box, and during one of the key plays of the second home game, I was, I was like this, like jittering, because it was so loud, the place was rocking. It was really cool, it, there was 27,000, but it felt like there were 57,000. Yeah, in the dough, I like the way they cram it in the lower bowl, because if you spread it out like that, you know, it looks, it looks like a half empty stadium, but when you put them all in that same area, it's pretty cool. No question about it, it's you fun. Know, one thing, uh, when I was walking up, it didn't seem, there was a lot of Stan Kroenke chants. <laughs> And it didn't seem like the team minded it too much, but you can tell St. Louis is still not over it, and this, it kind of opened up a little bit of a, a wound. Well, look, Stan Kroenke punched the city right in the face. Maybe kicked him in the stomach, too. It was, it was a terrible, terrible situation when a, a Missouri man took St. Louis's NFL team and moved it away because the billionaire wanted to make more billions. It was frustrating, and it's an ego thing, too. Like, we were proud. We were a proud city uh, as an NFL, NFL fan base, and now we have a chance to show that St. Louis loves its teams, its pro football teams. And no, this is not the NFL, but it's a bunch of fun. I mean, they're showing the games on ESPN and some major markets. You know, our STL TV had quite a presence down there. I mean, I'm down there and we see Shalene Houston and Kiaris Henry and Jerry Burrow and Joe Brown, the old Vince Ratcher, and all the guys from the union, you know, representing the networks, but they work here. They all got to go back together. The guys, Jim Delaney and Ken Roberts up in the booth. You know, yeah. it's kind of like everybody's back, and it was almost like just bizarre and almost it's really weird, like in this different setting with all the same people and the same crews. Except there's happiness. <laughs> Those last years with the Rams, everyone was going to work, but uh, man, there was a lot of depression going on around the Rams. They weren't doing well, and they were looking to leave. Well, now here we have a team that wants to be here and people that want to cover the team. All right, let's move on to spring training. St. Louis Cardinals, you spent, what, three weeks down in spring training this year? Yeah. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are I wish I was tanner. <laughs> you're still with. there. Yeah, 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 or that I was still there. Um, my thoughts are the Cardinals are in good hands with their young players coming up, notably Dylan Carlson and Nolan Gorman. I was able to spend time with both these young sluggers, and they're very, very impressive young men. They're humble, and they can hit the heck out of the ball. And we got a nice left-handed pitcher who will probably be slated for the minor leagues that's been involved in a lot of trade rumors uh, along with Matt Carpenter. 
Yeah, that's Matthew Liberator, and he's a lefty. He's got great stuff. Uh, I, I spoke to his personal pitching coach who talked a lot about how he watches old film of Sandy Koufax and some of the other great lefties of all time. Uh, the kid wants to learn. The kid wants to get better, and he has an appreciation for history. Will he be with the Cardinals uh, anytime soon? No. Will he be in a Cardinals trade anytime soon? Well, maybe if they're looking to get Nolan Arenado from Colorado, he'd be a key piece to that. Now, Dylan Carlson, a lot of people want him, too, but isn't he kind of untouchable? Oh. Or is anybody untouchable? Don't, no, no, no. Dylan Carlson is untouchable unless they offer, like, Mike Trout and, uh, and <laughs> you know, and, and maybe Rendon for, for Dylan Carlson. Uh, I kid. I mean, they don't want to trade the guy. He is the best hitting prospect St. Louis has had since the late Oscar Tavares. Um, he walks so much. So in addition to his slugging, in addition to his hitting to all fields, he gets on base all the time. So what do you think the prospects of Anthony Reyes coming back and Carlos Martinez? Will he be in the bullpen or as a starter? You probably mean Alex Reyes. And when Alex you look Reyes. at Alex Reyes, Anthony Reyes, of course, pitched in the 2006 team. Alex Reyes, my goodness, what talent, uh, what frustration. Uh, he, he seems to get hurt every year, and a new slate has been given this year. And so far, so good in spring training. Uh, with Carlos Martinez, I feel that he is a key player to whether or not St. Louis will make the playoffs again. Does he become a starting pitcher and maximize his talent, or do they put him back in the bullpen and we don't see the, the most of Carlos? And that would be really frustrating. We've talked about this before. Matt Carpenter, they put the shift on him. They shift him out of his batting average. He seems reluctant to put down the bunt, which <laughs> kind of drives me nuts when you see a whole empty left side of the field. When you were in spring training, did you see him working on his game and doing anything different this year? Yeah, one piece of optimism is Matt Carpenter is looking to hit to all fields this year. Kind of like he did in his early years with St. Louis when he had a whole bunch of doubles and they went to all parts of the outfield. I'm excited to see Matt Carpenter have a rejuvenated season, similar to the way Dexter Fowler did last year. You've written some really neat columns with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and uh, STL Today. Uh, Jason Tatum getting some <laughs> love from LeBron James, one of them. How cool is that? Jason Tatum, a St. Louis native, getting a shout-out from LeBron as one of the young superstars in the NBA. LeBron said that the league is in good hands with youngsters like Zion Williamson, John Morant, and, of course, Jason Tatum, who is not just a budding star. He is a current star in the NBA. He was an all-star in the past month of... February, he averaged 29 points per game and shot 50% from the field. And I think he dunked over some uh, some pretty proud yes. players. Yes, he is <laughs> he is unflappable and unafraid out there, and he and the Celtics could make a run for the title this year. So did you enjoy the NHL All-Star game? Oh, my goodness. How much fun was that? Having, that was fun. Yeah, it was a bunch of fun, and the, the, the creativity of all the uh, the, the, the shots, the, the shooting thing the night, excuse me, the night before. Yeah, the alumni night. The, the alumni game. Awesome. Oh, my gosh. It was, it was a bunch of fun. Uh, and for me, it showed St. Louis in the greatest of lights. And I spoke to Gary Bettman, the commissioner, and then was in touch with him again last week, and then also... Tom Stoneman, the owner of the Blues, everyone is just so excited about how St. Louis has become this like hotbed of hockey. And we hear the phrase, the heartland of hockey. Well, now St. Louis is a hotbed of hockey. Yeah, and didn't they call St. Louis like the upcoming darlings of the yeah. league, perhaps? How cool is that? I mean, to think, I mean, they hosted the Winter Classic. Now they're being asked to participate in Winter Classics. They, of course, won the Stanley Cup. They could do it again this year. Oh, and they hosted one of the most Loved all-star games in NHL history. TripAdvisor has just recently say that St. Louis is one of the, the new top destinations to come for entertainment. Uh, it's trending in other outlets. And just think, Stan Kroenke said that you know we were not a, a good sports town. And look what we've done down at Union Station and with MLS coming to town. It's all turned around. Who would have thought? It's so cool. And I, I've, I've traveled a lot as a sports columnist, and I see a lot of different cities. And for me, I always was like, oh, man, St. Louis is kind of lagging behind. Not anymore. I mean, you look at everything from the Ferris wheel to the soda fountain to the aquarium to Union Station, all of that, and then there's going to be an MLS state-of-the-art soccer stadium right there. Oh, and we have the aforementioned Battle Hawks. And, of course, the Stanley Cup champion Blues and the perennial winning team in St. Louis Cardinals. There's a lot to be excited about. That's pretty amazing. we got another minute or so, but I wanted to mention a story you did on a, a local uh, athlete, Olympic hopeful, that... Uh, it, it plays fairly well in the Olympic trials. How cool is this? Julia Conan just started running long distance in 2016. She's only run four marathons in her life, and she won one. She won the one in Minneapolis, and now, this past month, she got to participate in the U.S. Olympic trials. Now, the only top three go to the Olympics. 
Still, she was ranked 24th entering the thing. She finished 10th. She got a medal. Oh, and then she got a diamond ring. Her boyfriend proposed marriage. Wow, that's amazing. Speaking of marriage, you're you're married to an STL TV personality, which is uh, pretty incredible. I want you yes. to shout out. Angela Hockman, that I is my that. wife. Now, how did you get her? I mean, she's like really I nice know. looking. I know, believe me, that's what everybody <laughs> says. And she's on close-up TV and in the kitchen, great personality, and then there's me. So you're any final thoughts? Uh, we've got opening day coming up soon. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll be right up there in the press box like you always are. You know, with the coronavirus and things like that, do you see any new rules in the press box or any, any more things? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very fascinated to see how the leagues handle this. And, of course, the Cardinals have a trip overseas to London in June. We'll see uh, how that goes. Well, Benjamin, thank you so much yeah. for joining us on Inside Sports. Congratulations on your marriage and uh, continued success with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. We really enjoy your work. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. We're going to take a break now, but when we return, we're going to visit the Enterprise Center for Arch Madness. Plus, reporter Melanie Steen has an interesting story which investigates how being good at video games can score you a job. We'll be right back. Hmm, maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made her college years happen. Watcha! Opening that education savings account when she was little. Spearheading a campus tour. And another, and another, and another, and another. Bam! Deciphering financial aid. She was like, what? Well, now she's like, yeah! you waste planning for college. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. So there you are, shuffling through a stack of resumes and you come to mind. This is it. First impression, my way in. But can my resume show you how I truly stand out? Like that I was studying, going to night school while working two jobs just to help my parents pay for groceries. Or being the first one to always step up. No, that's something you just can't put on paper. Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent that is dedicated, hardworking, and determined like me. Yes, and right now I'm down here at the Enterprise Center, home of the 2020 Arch Madness, another great tournament with a lot of twists and turns we'll tell you about. But right now I'm going to throw it over to Melanie Steen, Inside Sports Reporter, where she's going to show you how being successful in video games in college can turn into a career. SIUE is one of only a handful of schools in the entire country offering eSports to its students. It took about a year and a half to transform this old computer lab into a state-of-the-art arena. Shakespeare. <laughs> two for two. It's not your dad's way of playing video games or even your older brother's. This is eSports, and from the looks of it, it's no longer a trend, but here to stay. It's, kind of, it's like the unique thing about eSports, like body size, skill level, gender, things like that don't matter. It's like really, it's inclusive, it's for everyone. The eSports club at SIUE started off as a group of gamers getting together for some fun, but that quickly changed. They compete against other universities, just how our basketball team, our football team play against other universities. Uh, they're in conferences and, and uh, leagues that are put on by national and regional governing bodies. Students started asking about like, we really want space for gaming and things like that, and this is definitely a trend that we we're seeing right now um, nationally. Uh, we started talking about, hey, we've got this big space, why not utilize it to the best of our ability? The gaming arena is located inside SIUE's Bluff Hall. The state-of-the-art facility had its grand opening in January of 2020. Peak hours are 2 until 11 p.m. Yeah, so there, with eSports, there are certain uh, teams that play more than others. Overwatch is a really big game. Uh, Call of Duty is really big. League of Legends. There, I could go on and on. There's a lot of other games. I'd say there's probably about 10 main games that people play. But the nice thing about this space is people can play really whatever they want, whatever fits you know, their tastes. Uh, as long as they come and sit down, they can log on and play it. If we can have an opportunity for them to be a little bit more competitive, play against other universities. Uh, so now we have 10 competitive teams, and there's anywhere 
200 plus students in the organization. So we have about 60 to 80 competitive gamers who are on teams, and the other ones are casual recreational gamers. It is safe to say that sports has a way of connecting us, no matter what age, gender, or background. And eSports is no different. I actually think the presence of the arena has allowed us to grow some type of a community on campus, just like any other club organization, honestly. And I spend time with people who I never would have spent time with. I'd say the biggest myth or misconception is, A, that they're like antisocial people who just hide in their apartment. Because honestly, when you have a space like this, it, it's how you bring everybody together. I'm Melanie Steen reporting for Inside Sports. this place yeah we're, we're, we're getting better every year we're getting better every year and that's what you want to do as a program and I think last year we came in with the mentality we can win this thing we did this year we expected to win it and and uh, I was just proud of our guys and how they responded tell you about the team concept with the, with the Braves. Our team is deep. Our team is deep. Everybody coming ready to play any night. And we said anybody can, anybody can go off any night. And it, we, it's a team effort. Definitely a team effort. Two in a row, how's it feel? Feels great. I don't even know what to say no more. I don't even know what to say. I really celebrate. had five guys, all your starters and double figures. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, uh, what a credit to our hard work, determination. I mean, um, all this whole weekend, I mean, we've just been playing through adversity, playing tough. I mean, it really is just the character of these guys, and we just never back down and never quit. So, really special moment for us to especially go back to back. Looks like the Bradley Braves fans came out here today. A lot of them probably made the road trip out last night. Yeah, they did. I mean, uh, the amount of people here, I mean, we have the biggest fan base out of anybody, so you can just tell how much the community supports Bradley. I mean, it really is special. I mean, it means so much to have people um, supporting you all the way through it. How'd you like the way the tournament was run here in St. Louis? Uh, they do a great job. I mean, especially here at the Enterprise Center and the NBC. I mean, uh, what a setup. I mean, this is the best environment, and I'm all mid-major basketball, so I mean, uh, it's really fun, and I'm glad to be a part of it. turning point of the game because Valpo is playing very well you know you guys are going back and forth but towards the end you guys really put a put a big push down I think the turning point was going to the zone in the second half it slowed them down in the offensive end they got kind of stagnant and they had some big turnovers and we got some office some long rebounds and led to some transition points for us back to back tournament wins here for Arch Madness you got to start loving St. Louis man I think St. Louis might be my second home it's special it's been special to us though man and just doing something that the program has never done before is always special, and it's a blessing. And joining me now is the commissioner of the Missouri Valley Conference, Doug Elgin. Doug, the 30th year here in St. Louis, beautiful weather, and another fascinating tournament. It really was, and certainly the teams that, that played in this event delivered. And I want to I want to thank all the fans, passionate fan base that was here. Great tournament atmosphere here in a refurbished Enterprise Center, and you just couldn't ask for more. 
You know, talk about the momentum of the Enterprise Center in downtown St. Louis. I mean, St. Louis is showing up on TripAdvisor lists and top five and ten lists of top destinations in, you know, in the country right now. And there's a testament to that, and a lot of it's because of right here. Unbelievable what the St. Louis Blues leadership did, the management did to, to power this through, the funding for this facility. It's an economic engine for St. Louis, and God bless the Blues. Yeah, and the city of St. Louis kicked in a lot of money, you know, as well as the Blues, to make sure we could continue to have events like this. 30th anniversary here in St. Louis, Doug, and, you know, how do you think it played out this year? Oh, I think it was a great tournament. Uh, we're, we're proud of the tradition and history that we have here, and, again, I, I just think it, it comes back to what really makes the tournament special is the caliber of play. And I, you, unbelievable talent out there on all 10 teams. It seems like the Cinderella story this year could be Valparaiso. I mean, I don't know if they've ever won a game in the tournament yet, and then they come and make it to the finals this year. I, I think that shows you what coming into the into the Missouri Valley does for programs. The, Loyola came into the, into the Valley five years later. They're in the Final Four. Valpo's building a program now, and this is really going to help their brand and help them recruit kids, and I'm, I'm happy for them that, that they advanced in the tournament and made such a great show. You know, so Northern Iowa and Loyola Chicago get knocked out early. Bradley comes back in, in a kind of a back-to-back -back repeat year, so it's pretty special for their program right now as the number one and two fell early. No question. I think Bradley now is, is established in our in our conference as a power, power team. They'll bet on this and watch out for the Braves down the road as well. You know, one thing I've noticed over the last few years is the Bradley Braves support system. I mean, their fans are coming out. At first, they, they had a nice showing, but it seems like these folks are coming down now in, in droves. I'd say traditionally, Bradley is one of the top brands of all time. Top draws with home attendance. You're going to see big crowds coming back. They had a crowd of over 9,000 for a home game this year, which is unusual. Basketball attendance nationally is dropping, but you're going to see the tradition of Bradley bringing back the fans, and I'm excited for the future of their program. You know, a lot of people are excited about this year being the 30th year. You had Kevin Harlan. You have uh, public officials that are in, you know, sending you letters of congratulations. How does that make you feel? Oh, uh, pretty, pretty special. I think the campus leadership that we have, our presidents have invested in their programs. You know, the fact that we've been able to stay here 30 years Without any interruption, St. Louis Blues have made way for us every year. Civic uh, and corporate St. Louis has been supportive, and you couldn't ask for a better partnership or a better location for our tournament than right here in St. Louis. And support from the governors is pretty special as well. It is. I mean, we're, we're really in a place now. We have an extension with Enterprise Center through 2025. So that's our 35th anniversary. So I'm looking for maybe the next 20 years to be here. The Missouri Valley sure hosts some great tournaments. And finally, we'd like to give our thoughts and prayers to the family of Alderman Sam Moore, who recently passed away with health issues. He was a leader in amateur boxing scene in St. Louis and was involved with Sumner High School. I worked on several in your ward projects with Alderman Moore, and he had a passion for public service. Alderman Moore, you will be missed. And folks, if you know of a local amateur athlete who deserves recognition, please email me at blackstockt at stlewis.mo.gov. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for watching Inside Sports. We'll see you next time.